Alex says. Are you ready? You are listening to the Ducks and Pucks podcast with your hosts, Mike Walters and Eddie Jones. This is the number one home for Anaheim Ducks talk and analysis. Here we go. Well, welcome to the show. This is your host, Mike Walters, along with my co-host, Eddie Jones. And we have a positive show for you. The Ducks, uh, since our last show, Eddie, have uh, turned it around and have won three games in a row. Um, if you didn't catch our last show, we had uh, Hannah Spreaker on from the fourth period. We talked a lot about Murray, which we'll get into a little bit in this show as well. And uh, we recorded uh, just before the Chicago game. So we were hoping the Ducks would turn things around, and obviously they have, and you've got to be super happy with them winning the last three. So we'll get into that. We'll talk about some trades, talk about some updates on some of the players, and uh, you know a little bit of news around the league as well. So where we left off on the last show, Eddie, we were we were t- talking about Murray. Um, everybody was upset about those comments. You know the Ducks were kind of you know playing so so, and then we had these games coming up. Obviously Chicago a slumping team, so we were kind of nervous about that. We had Minnesota which obviously they're fighting it out for. And then, of course, Vegas, which the Ducks had never beaten until, of course, this week. Um, so, interesting week, Eddie. Uh, we thought that the Ducks maybe could get four points. They ended up getting six, and it all started in Chicago, where actually the Ducks got behind uh, in this game, 2 uh, nothing. They had their all-star scorers of Keith and Saad that have been tearing it up this season uh, get some goals. Uh, as, you, as you know, it seems like the <laughs> players that don't score, score against yeah. the Ducks. I, I don't know what it is. So, I was at home watching this, and uh, probably like some of you, I was a little upset, and I may have been yelling at the TV, too, like some of you. And, um, well, uh, right after they got that two-goal lead, Eddie uh, Richie scores right away, and uh, Kase then scores, and then Henrique gets a goal, and and the uh, quote-unquote, as we call it, the hard hat line uh, ended up uh, bringing the Ducks back, and they won this one. Yeah, I mean, this line has been on fire for arguably the last 20 games, if not longer. I mean, they've really been the spark that's been able to keep the Ducks afloat, and I don't think it's what we what line we expected to be the best line for the Ducks at this point in the season. Obviously, Getzoff, Perry, and Raquel have been better, and uh, Kessler, Silverberg, and Coglano have struggled, but this is a great... I mean, this is probably the best game for this line um, as a whole. We've seen Henrik and Kasha have, have good moments, uh, throughout the season when they've been put together. But I think Richie kind of stepped up and finally brought the offense in this one. I mean, he made a really nice move on uh, on the goal right after Saad scored to, to put the Ducks uh, behind just one. Uh, and then he has a good one-two with, uh, with Kasha on that play as well. I mean, the, the chemistry just seems like it's starting to build for everybody on this line. Uh, and it's something the Ducks are going to need going forward. I, I mean, for them to come back... And, and tied at two going into the third period, I think, was huge. And, and Chicago made a big push. I mean, they made a push about halfway through the uh, through the third period to try and get back into it. You know, Henrik scored the goal, and then pretty much after that goal, it was all Blackhawks, and the Ducks were kind of able to hold on. I, I was a little bit surprised they were able to hold on because of, of how hard Chicago was pushing. Yeah, we've talked about that when the Ducks hold on and how frustrating it gets. But like you said, they were able to do it in this one. Um, they pulled it out. Uh, you know, we hadn't seen the comeback kids, quote unquote, in a long time. They actually did it in this game. They also did it in the uh, Minnesota game, which we'll get to in a minute. So, like you said, though, this line's really been heating up. Uh, been carrying the Ducks uh, at least in these last couple games here. Um, Henrik, you know, six game-winning goals now since he's been with the Ducks. I mean, leading the league. I mean, that's crazy. So he, he's just been outstanding. Another, just like Eves last year, you know, one of the best uh, pickups that Murray has done uh, during the season. Uh, and talking about Murray, too, obviously, you know, some of the comments we talked about, you know, what are they going to do on the last show as far as the defense and fixing things. And in this game, uh, there was, a, a you know, I guess a Bronx cheer maybe before the game, Eddie, because uh, Bieksa did not play in this game. Um, Peterson came in and played. He actually had a decent game. You know, he was plus two, had um, two blocks. He was very good in his uh, puck possession stats. He led all defensemen. And he played about uh, 13 minutes, Eddie. What did you think about Peterson and his NHL debut? Yeah, I I mean, this was a really, really strong debut against a a team that's kind of led the league for the majority of the season. They've been bad, but they've led the league in, in shot attempts and course before for, for a lot of for the majority of the season. Boston's caught up and other teams have caught up, but for him to do so well uh, in his first start, he only played about 12 minutes, but he finished the, the game with about 65% course before, which was great. He played with Manson, which which obviously helps, but 
uh, I think he was really solid and and he played to his strengths. Uh, you, you know, if, if Pedersen's playing good, you rarely notice him out there because he's you know he's playing solid. He, he doesn't contribute too much to the offense. Gets up pinches when he needs to, but it was a really strong effort from him. And I was kind of disappointed that he actually only ended up playing about twelve minutes. But I get it. You know, it's his first game. He's coming in. He's he's replacing Bieksa essentially in in the lineup. So you know, I th- I think it was a, a good effort from him. To, to come in, you know, first game playing a tough, you know, grinding out a tough win against uh, the Blackhawks. And, and he played a couple minutes on the PK, too. He played about a minute 23 with Manson on the PK, so they're giving him a little bit more opportunities. And, and I think all in all, a really strong effort for, from him in this first game. Yeah, like you said, they gave him a decent, you know, sample size. He had, like, mm-hmm. you, like you said, 12 minutes of uh, five-on-five action and then uh, oh, almost a minute 30 on the PK, which, I mean, that's pretty good if you're you're bringing up uh, a young defenseman and you're putting him on the uh, penalty kill like that. That shows that uh, Carl has some faith in him. So a uh, pretty good game overall uh, by him. I know he had one, one like, little mishap in there in one of the, one of the uh, plays where he kind of got tripped up, but... Other than that, he looked really good, and uh, you know the Ducks rolled into Minnesota on on that Saturday game, which was a super early game. Uh, as you know, it was the uh, 11 a.m. Pacific start time, which is one of the earliest uh, start times the Ducks have had. But they rolled into this game. They went with Peterson again, Eddie. This time they took out Boschman instead, and. Um, you know the way that this game worked uh it started out good um the ducks got a power play right away which uh, first that's a shocker we know that the ducks don't get a lot of calls it <laughs> seems like but they got a power play right away Corey perry with a nice move um you know just sliding it uh on the backhand in for this early score you know not even a minute into the game after that though minnesota picked it up they ended up getting the next two goals and you know it looked like maybe minnesota would you know, pull this one out, which obviously this was a huge game. You know that the Ducks and the Wild have been kind of fighting it out um, for that second wild card spot. I mean, along with everybody else, but the Wild have been one of the ones the Ducks have been chasing. And, uh, you know, that third line again, we talked about it. Uh, Kase ends up scoring to tie this game. Ducks go to overtime. There's no goals in overtime. They go to the shootout. Um, Getzloff scores first, then Parise scores, so they were tied after the, uh, the the first set of three, basically, and then you know after that you go one shooter each. Uh, Niederreiter scored, and it looked like maybe the Ducks are out of it, but of course Kase scores, keeps it going, it goes all the way, um, you know, to eleven rounds in this one, and Richie uh, ends up getting the game winner. So uh, another another you know. The third line basically getting the win done in this one as well for the Ducks. Eddie, an exciting game. We had a watch party, which people showed up super early, which was awesome. People showed up at 9 a.m. <laughs> for this, so which was great. I remember getting there, and I'm like, wow, there's people here super early for a, a brunch watch party, which was fun, and it was good to see the Ducks win, Eddie. Um, they probably could have played a little bit better in this game, you know, in the middle part, but, you know, at least they pulled out the two points uh, against the Wild. Yeah, I think the Wild controlled most of the play pretty much up until Cash's goal, and then the Ducks kind of started turning it on. Uh, it was a, a strong push. Like, if you look at, uh, I think it was Koiv who had the first goal, you look at his goal, and then pretty much from there on until their second goal and a little bit into the second period, it was all Minnesota. Uh, and it looked like they were kind of taking over the game, and, and it was going to be a tough game for the Ducks. But credit to them for fighting back. Kasha gets the game-tying goal, and, and they're able to fight it out and, and get the extra point in the shootout. And it's something we haven't seen them do a lot of, being able to grind out these games against good teams. And, and you know, we talked about how Minnesota and, and Vegas were so good at home. So these are going to be difficult points to get a, against these teams. And, you know, you're fighting with Minnesota for that final wildcard spot. So picking up that extra point is huge. And, and I think, you know, they've kind of got... Uh, a little bit of fire under them right now after after Murray's comments. You know, you go and you, you lose a really bad game against Detroit. You grind out a win against Chicago. You grind out another win against uh, against Minnesota. And they're kind of looking like the team we expected them to be. Being able to play these close games, grind out these wins, hold on to leads, or come back and, and get, you know, get a win after being down a couple goals. And, and I think it's starting to trend in the right direction. I, I think, you know, these are two solid games against some very strong opponents. Yeah, uh, they are trending in the right direction. As you said, you know, we talked about it. We hoped that they would get, 
you know, two wins out of these three games. They obviously got all three wins. Uh, we'll get to, of course, the Vegas game, which was their best performance out of all three. But um, this one was kind of interesting, too, because don't forget the other storyline here is uh, Ryan Kessler didn't play in this game. Mm-hmm. He actually sat out with a lower body injury, which, I mean, we pretty much all know it's his hip, obviously, because of the surgery. He hasn't really been 100% the whole season. So Grant came in and played in this game. And, I mean, you could kind of tell it affected some of the face-offs because the Ducks had only won 41% in this game, which I think goes back to your point about the Wild carrying the play, especially in the in the middle of the um, the game up until, you know, the probably early part of the third there. Um, but that was a huge part too, Eddie. You know, a lot of fans had concern about that, and we've been doing um, kind of weekly poll questions now. What do you think about Kessler? Because... He obviously comes back and he plays in the Vegas game, like I said, and we'll talk about it in a minute. But we put out some options out there. A majority of the fans thought that in our poll question, almost half thought that they should shut him down for a few games. And then about a, a fourth of you thought, let him keep playing. Another fourth of you thought, you know, just hang on till the playoffs. And then a very small percentage said just, you know, shut him down the whole season. But what do you think? They They ended up. I thought maybe they would shut him down in the Vegas game, but they didn't. You, you think you agree with the fans? Maybe they should shut him down for maybe a few games. I mean, obviously they didn't this last one, but maybe going forward a couple games, uh, you know, up until the playoffs. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's tough because you need him even playing at, at I guess you could say around fifty percent uh, of what he you know he normally would be playing at. You kind of need him still in the lineup. I think obviously the Ducks had him, uh, didn't have him against Minnesota, and, and played a pretty strong game without him, but. Uh, it's a tough question to answer because I think you need him in the lineup to make the playoffs, but then you also need him to be 100% healthy come playoff time to make a strong push. So it's kind of, you know, I think the Ducks have to get themselves in a good enough position to really have the ability to sit him out. And I think winning these three games is a big, you know, a good start to that. They're sitting uh, pretty right now in the Pacific Division uh, after picking up six points and, and, you know, Calgary dropped a couple points here and there. Uh, LA is kind of picked up and won. San Jose has dropped a couple points as well. So they're starting to move up in the standings. And, and I think, you know, come after the trade line, to, trade deadline, depending what they do, it will look, it'll kind of change the outlook maybe on, on if they can sit Kessler. I mean, obviously, if they go out and they add a four, and I think that helps you maybe rest him a couple games or, or sit him out, like you said, for a little bit longer. Uh, but if they don't, then I, I think they have to get themselves in a pretty comfortable position before they decide to sit him out and rest him. Yeah, I agree with you. I think I agree with the majority of the fans. I, I think, you know, obviously almost 50 percent said shut him down for a few games. I think that they should with the caveat, like you said, the thing is, though, is the Ducks still need to you know qualify for the playoffs. So it, it's tough. It's a balancing act because we know he's not been 100 percent at all this whole season he's never been 100 percent. maybe he's been somewhere between maybe 50 and 80 i would say depending on you've watched some of these games some of them he's played really really solid other games you can tell well most of the games you can tell he, he's not quite 100 percent. but some he's he's uh, you know had to struggle a little bit more than others with that said too you know <laughs> out of all the players on this team who is the most fiery competitor on this team I mean, I'm not saying that the others aren't, but you know that Kessler is pretty high on that list of of being a competitor. So I think it's tough, too, to tell him, hey, you know, you're going to sit out X amount of games. He's going to be like, nah, nah, I'm going to play, you know. So that's another thing. You can't – it's tough. You can't just tell a player, hey, dude, you're you're sitting out, you know. I mean, they did in the Minnesota one, but I don't think you can do it for an extended amount of time. Um, But I wouldn't put it past the guys, uh, you know, uh, Murray and Carlisle to maybe sit them out here and there, you know, spot, spot, maybe certain games. Like uh, we'll talk about the games coming up here against Arizona and Edmonton. I could see him maybe, um, maybe sitting out the one against uh, Arizona per se, Mm -hmm. uh, or Edmonton, either one, both those teams haven't been doing as well. Not, not to say that the the ducks are going to smash both of them. They should, but um, I could see something like that. But, you know, the strategy paid off. I mean, like we said, the Ducks didn't do well in the face-off circle, had a little bit of struggles in the, in the middle part of this game. But they were able to get the two points at a not in regulation, but at least they pulled it out in the shootout and they, they leapfrogged the wild. And like you said, uh, they've been kind of sitting in third the last couple nights. Yeah, it's it's such a tough question. And I, and I know I've already said that, but... You know, you you don't want to sit a guy who's valuable to your lineup like that uh, when you're making a playoff push. And and, and I'm going to bring it up again. I I think if we see him sit 
for a long period of time for an ex- for a couple games, maybe a week or two, then I think it's closer to playoffs when the Ducks kind of know where they stand, and, and hopefully by that time they're they're you know solidified at least a decent lead. Uh, and are sitting comfortably in the Pacific Division, but we don't know. And, and I think, uh, you know, if you're going to go right now and you're going to sit them for a game or two, then I think it's like you said. You, you look at a back-to-back, you're playing a team in Arizona that you should be beating no matter what. I think, you know, he doesn't really have to... Sh- There's not really any guy that he will be tasked with shutting down with in that game if he's in it. You know, maybe Clayton Keller, you can argue. But I think that would be a game if you're going to sit him. That that'd be a game to sit him for, and then bring him back uh, after extended rest after Dallas and play him against uh, Edmonton, where he has a role to play in shutting down Connor McDavid. So I, I think that'd be the best thing right now until the Ducks get in a comfortable spot. Yeah, I, I agree. And there's a, a good amount of time between that Dallas and Arizona game. So even if he sits mm-hmm. out the Arizona game, there's a good time that he could play in the Edmonton one and obviously go against Connor McDavid. So. Um, with that, the Ducks then, uh, you know, they did, talking about strategy here, Eddie, we're talking about Murray and Carlisle, what they're going to do with Kessler. Well, they took some strategy into this game with Vegas. So after the Minnesota game, they went straight home. Uh, they came back to California, and then they flew out of John Wayne uh, on game day against Vegas. They even flew back after the game as well. So they went into the strategy. We we asked uh, Dan Wood and Steve Carroll about this whole Vegas flu. You know, Vegas had been uh, 22, 4, and 2 at home before this game. And some people have talked about, well, you know, teams show up there early and they party too much and yada, yada, yada. Uh, Dan Wood and Steve Carroll dismissed that. They, they said that Vegas is just a good team at home. Um, and it, it was interesting because that's what the Ducks did, and then it actually it paid off. Um, we saw Kessler did play in this game. You could tell he wasn't 100%. Peterson played again. Uh, Boschman was out. Uh, the Ducks got an early goal uh, by Silverberg. They had another one that was uh, taken away, which we'll talk about a little bit. And then they had Manson um, scoring with a, you know that redirection. Um, totally planned, of course, if you, if you saw that play. <laughs> but the Ducks um, played a good game. They were they were even in the faceoff circle. Um, they never got a power play chance, uh, which you know is what it is with the calls. We've seen that before. Um, didn't do so well in the shots. They got out shot thirty three to twenty. And Vegas did you know have a strong push in the second half of this game. But overall, um, you have to be uh, extremely happy with the Ducks, Eddie. They, they go into this you know Golden Knight team that seems unbeatable at home. They even wear their white jerseys, which they you know had worn, worn before and were 7-0 and zero in that previous game. And the Ducks come in and, and um, they show that uh, even the Knights can lay a goose egg. Yeah, and I mean, this is the game we kind of pegged as being the most difficult game of of this road trip and and you know for good reason like you said Vegas was 22 4 and 2 at home they were 14 1 and 1 against the Pacific Division both of those losses came coming against Edmonton so they were pretty much perfect against every team but the Oilers in the Pacific Division so this was going to be tough from the beginning obviously Neil didn't play in this game cuz he uh, cuz of an illness Theodore didn't play also cuz of an illness so a little bit easier matchup for the Ducks but you still got Marsha show Smith Carlson you still got a, a very good lineup and their flurry was starting so I think this was a, a really strong game for the Ducks they, they played a really really tight defensive game something we haven't kind of seen for a while and that's hard to do uh, against such a fast team in, in the Golden Knights and they're able to kind of slow the play down play a solid defensive style and, and it really worked up until the third period I, I mean they limited Vegas to 13 shots in goal uh, going into the third period, which was their lowest of the season, and their previous lowest was 21. So, I mean, that that's the most Vegas has been shut down in the entire season. So it's arguably the best game anybody's played defensively against Vegas going into the third period. And then, again, uh, I mean, there's more Gibson, more Gibson injury uh, issues that come up. <laughs> Miller has to yep. come in net. Uh, and what a performance from him. I mean, Vegas just turns it on in the third period. They have 20 shots in that third period. And, and Miller turns turns away all of them. And then Getzlaff is able to get that uh, that shot going in off, off Manson's foot. And this is something we've waited to see from the Ducks against good teams. Being able to hold on to a lead when they start pushing. Getting some good goaltending. Playing playing solid defensive hockey. And holding on to a, a well, it was initially a one goal and then a two goal lead. And I think this was huge for them. And it's not really going to affect them too much in the standings on catching Vegas. But it's a huge win to beat a team that was so good at home and so good against the other teams in their division. 
Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, uh, Vegas, you know, they started to turn it on at the end of the second period and then they just went crazy in that third period. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, Gibson, uh, lower body injury, uh, day to day. That's the, the latest, uh, on him. Um, you know, that happened at the end of the second period. He stayed in. I mean, there's only a couple seconds left and then obviously he went out to begin the third and Miller came in. Um, yeah, that part we're going to just have to monitor, and when some more updates come out, we'll have to see. Um, it may factor into what happens this week, so maybe Miller goes in that game, and then they have several days off until Arizona-Edmonton. I mean, there's a possibility that Miller could even play Arizona, and then uh, maybe Gibson doesn't play till Sunday against Edmonton. I mean, there, there's that kind of possibility, or vice versa on the Saturday or whatever. So at least the Ducks only have one game you know, the next three four days, so that kind of helps out a little bit on the schedule. But yeah, like you said, you know, the concern on our last show when we talked with Hannah was about the defense trade deadline, what the Ducks should do and playing a team like Vegas. I, I was really surprised. Uh, like you said, Eddie, the, the first two periods, they kept them to 13 shots. Um, even the two power plays that Vegas had, uh, you know, they're a little dangerous, but nothing, you know, didn't the Ducks weren't getting dominated. They're playing really, really good. Um, of course, it got scary that they were trying to hang on again in the third period. But part of that, too, that was frustrating was Getzloff had a goal and it was taken away on the offsides uh, call that Vegas challenged, which I know you hate this rule, <laughs> at least the way that this one was reviewed. When I first saw it, um, you know, the way it was shown on the TV, it, it looked like it was a questionable call. Then they showed the replay, and you can tell that when Raquel um, is at the blue line that his right skate is down and his left skate is up. So by the rule, he's you know inside the zone, and, it, and it's called back correctly, like we said, by the books. But uh, you're not really happy with this uh, rule, Eddie, and I'm not either. Yeah, I, I understand it because in all technicalities, he's he's in the zone, like you said, because one skate is in, his other skate is off the ice, so technically he's in the zone even though his skate is hovering above the blue line. But you have to then define, is it you know is it in the zone if his skate's on the ice or is it offside if he breaks the plane of the blue line? And I think that's what they kind of have to define. I think it should be if he breaks the plane. So then if your foot's off the ice, it is an offside because technically you haven't gone past the blue line, even though your foot is off the ice. And, and I understand, you know, it was the right call from the refs in this game because that's how the rule is now. But I think it, it's something they have to fix. And I, and I think they should change it. Honestly, I, I think if, you know, and it's not just because it went against the ducks. I've seen this go against a lot of teams where, you know, if, if the foot's off the line, it ends up getting called back, and, and it's not a goal. But, I mean, in all honesty, in my opinion, they're still on side if they haven't crossed the blue line. So I think it's something they can look into changing. Whether they do or not, I, I don't know. I think they have to give a, a hard look at offside reviews as a whole. I know they've changed a couple of things this year, especially with the coach's challenge and the risk of a penalty. But I think there still are plenty of issues with the offside review. So it's something they're going to take a look at, and they're still kind of evolving. But it just it's just that one thing that kind of gets on my nerves with with plays. It just it happens so often where the guy skate us off the ice, and it's such a disappointing thing to have to overturn a goal for. Yeah, and if you were watching this game, whether you were there in person, which, by the way, there were a ton of Duck fans there. It sounded like they invaded uh, T-Mobile Arena, which was great to see a lot of orange jerseys there. Um, so that was good to see. But if you go from that play on, Eddie, too, that's kind of where the momentum really shifted in that game because, you know, it was in the second period. The Ducks looked like they could have gone into the third up 2-0. to zero. Instead, they go up 2-1, to one, and Vegas... You know, they came out strong uh, in the third period. I mean, they, they finished the second period strong, too. Um, it, it could have been a change. I mean, if they would have gotten a goal and tied it up one-to-one, -one, we could have been seeing a different outcome. I mean, fortunately, um, you know, that set play between Getzloff and Manson that they've been practicing a lot really worked. <laughs> so that, that ricochet off Manson skate ended up, uh, you know, you know, helping the Ducks. But, yeah, like you said, the, the, that call – the way the rule is and stuff, you know, it has an impact on the game. And obviously the, the momentum totally shifted in favor of Vegas. The Ducks withstood the storm, got that goal. They won this game. Uh, you know, s some good stats, too, that came out of this one, Eddie. Uh, you had Miller and Gibson with a shutout. Mm -hmm. um, they were talking about that's the 64th time that's happened in the NHL, and it's the first time it happened this season. 
So that was pretty crazy. And it's also the second time it's happened in Ducks history. You have to go back to Jaguar and Shields in 2001 when it happened, Eddie. So, I mean, at least the Ducks goalies, uh, <laughs> you know, that's never been an issue for the Ducks this season. Is, uh, you know, if Miller has to play some games here, Gibson out, I'm not too concerned. Yeah, I think there's a couple key things in this game. And a lot of guys getting back on track, especially the big guys. I mean, Getzlaff had a very strong game in this one. Uh, essentially had two goals. One was called back, and, and the other one goes in off Manson's foot. <laughs> but for him to get a point, he was struggling a bit as of late, wasn't getting any points on the board. So I think that's big for him. I think Silverberg finally getting a goal yes. is huge for his confidence, and hopefully that line can get going. Um, and I think you know we're finally seeing things turn around for Brandon Montour and obviously a lot of that is the fact that now he's paired with with Cam Fowler and not Francois Beauchemin so that's obviously a big <laughs> part to that they still have a long way to go as a pairing but I think they've looked decent together and I think you know they can continue to go from here whether these defensive pairs get you know and to get shaken up anymore or whatever and if it all depends if Pedersen stays up um, we have a question about that so we'll get into that later anyway but I think at least things are starting to look up for Brandon Montour. And then you look at Ryan Miller as well coming in and having a strong game after struggling for a bit and really having a strong third period, keeping the Ducks in it, making 20 saves, like you said, getting the combined shutout with John Gibson. I think that's big for his confidence too. And and in this one, you didn't have to have the third line carrying the Ducks. You had uh, the other two lines contributing and everybody kind of working together for, for a strong team win uh, against a very really difficult opponent. Yeah, I think that there was a chance here for Vegas to really try to win this game and blow the Ducks out of the water, so to speak, in the third period. Um, they knew Miller was coming in cold uh, after Gibson was out. They knew that they had a goal called back in their favor. Uh, a lot of things were going their way, and they really tried. And, uh, you know, you got to give the Ducks credit. Um, you know, they didn't play the best defense in the third period, but they got that other goal, and they were able to win this one. A big win. The Ducks continue to hang on to that third place spot now you know they were chasing 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 now they're you're in the mix i mean obviously calgary and the kings are in there of course san jose you know i mean it's, it's still a big jumble of, of teams but the ducks are in the thick of it now um you know after all those comments from murray like i said i thought it was uh, more motivational is what he was aiming for. It may not have been delivered that way, but it seemed like it, it's been working. You know, another aspect to this too, Eddie, that you and I had talked about um, uh, about this uh, strategy against Vegas were some of the comments that Getzloff had. Um, what did you think, um, you know, in Eric Stevens' article when they talked about this strategy of flying out on game day and, and, and Getzloff, uh, you know, saying that it was basically Murray's call? Yeah, I think there was a, you know, it, we only are reading it, so it's hard to really, you know, judge the tone uh, of his uh, of his answer to the question. But it just kind of seems like there's a bit of animosity behind his comments, and, and I'll read them just so you guys, if you haven't seen them. Uh, this was him referring, to, like Mike said, to the fact that they decided to fly right back to Anaheim and not straight to LA, and then, or sorry, not straight to Vegas, and then flying to Vegas on Monday morning and missing the morning skate. So he said, it is what it is. They put the plan in place. That's Bob's call. A situation like this, uh, sorry, a situation like this, Bob made the call. That's what he wanted to do, and we just live with it. If we win, he's a genius. If we don't, then it didn't work. So again, I, I think, you know, it, it's hard to judge the tone of that. It does seem like it's a little bit, you know, not really a shot, but like I said, a little bit of animosity towards Bob Murray and the, some of the decisions he's made. It's really hard to judge not hearing exactly how he said it, but it's definitely interesting to kind of take note of that. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's something that happens with us too. Is sometimes we post things on Twitter and certain people, it gets lost in translation. Like it's, it's meant to be sarcastic or it's meant to be funny and, and people mm -hmm. take it serious. So sometimes I have to remember to tell people, and it's not just me that runs the account. I know a lot of people think it's always me. I know you you help out and there's a few other people. I have to remind all of us to sometimes throw in a funny emoji or something because sometimes things can get lost. And like you said, we're not hearing him say it. It's just written in print. So you don't know the tone or the inflection of Getzloff's voice. So you have to give him that. I mean, but you're right. It does seem a little bit, you know, confrontational because he's kind of like, well, that's his decision. We have to live with it kind of a thing. But again, I don't know how he's saying it, and it paid off. So I guess Murray is a genius, <laughs> at least for this one, for for the win against Vegas. And and speaking of 
you know, uh, tweets and comments out there. There were some that were posted, Eddie, that um, there's no mistake about what they were talking about. And uh, <laughs> a couple of them came from some Vegas fans. Um, there were some funny tweets. We had um, the one that we replied to. Uh, if you didn't see it, uh, Carrie was on there uh, talking about her fiance of eight years. Good Lord, eight years. But she was saying that uh, that Vegas, if they won, that she would get married. And, and then we joked that uh, he was rooting for the Ducks. So that one was a pretty funny one, Eddie. I thought um, I thought the bigger story wasn't so much whether or not Vegas was going to win, but but eight years. I mean, I don't know. I think my wife would have been gone <laughs> after a couple of years if I didn't marry her. I th- I think it was funny that uh, I mean I I didn't see too much of it, but the fact that it turned out there was apparently a Ducks fan, <laughs> or he was cheering for the Ducks or something, sitting in the same seat. So I I thought that was kind of funny following that situation. I mean, we had a. Uh, we had somebody tweet out that I that I saw and it got put in our in our Ducks Bucks group chat saying that uh, it was actually a Ducks fan cheering in that seat like you had said and yeah I mean if uh, if I'm still dating my girlfriend after eight years and I don't propose to her I think she'll be a little bit upset too. <laughs> yeah, that that was <laughs> excuse me that that was a funny uh, a situation and then um, the Ducks uh, responded to one of the uh, Vegas tweets with uh, Gatsloff hand- handing out the L, which they've used before. They used it against the Kings. And a Vegas fan, <laughs> good Lord, a new Vegas fan, I'm assuming, because it sounds like this person's about 22 <laughs> that they were saying, but they said, oh, it's going to be reversed, or quote unquote, it's going to be reversed when the Golden Knights whoop you in the Stanley Cup finals and become a champ, which I had just sat there and I had to shake my head for multiple reasons on this one, which it was so funny to see. Oh my God. I think everybody that was a Ducks fan on Twitter just (laughs) blew this lady Shauna up, but it was pretty funny because as you guys all know out there, the Ducks can't play the Knights in the Stanley cup final. There's no, also there's no S on the end of finals. It's not like uh, the NBA. So they kind of got blown out of water, but there was no mistake in that one, Eddie. And, um, I don't know, maybe she had too much to drink, but I just thought that that was pretty funny because all of a sudden everybody was educating this poor fan on the rules of yeah. the NHL. That was uh, that was something else. That was <laughs> it's a pretty uh, pretty bad. I, I woke up to that tweet this morning, so that was a funny way to wake up to and, and, and see that kind of blown up. But, yeah, I, I, I kind of give him a little bit of a pass because I, I understand you know, hockey's a bit new to a lot of people in Vegas, and, and I, I get it, and... You know, you're in the heat of the moment, and, and you just lost for, like, the first time in a while at home, so you're a little bit fired up. But, yeah, I mean, if you're going to start responding to to the Ducks Twitter about that, and, and you you better know what you're talking about because there's a lot of people who are going to see it and, and, and flame you pretty hard for that. I, I mean, at least she probably knows now that the realistically yeah. the latest the Ducks could meet the, the Golden Knights is in the conference final if – the Ducks got a wild card spot. Most likely, they would meet them in the second round of the playoffs. So, right. it's not it's, unless the standings change to or the playoffs change to a one to sixteen format. That I don't think for a long time <laughs> we're going to see the Ducks ever play the Golden Knights in the Stanley Cup final. But I'll give her a bit of a pass, like I said, just because you know it's new. It's a new thing to a lot of people in Vegas. But come on, I mean, if you if you're going to reply to 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 anybody Team. on Twitter. And yeah. it's out there now uh, you got to do a little bit of research before before that or you're going to get flamed yeah and, and you see that all the time different fans go at it and everything on twitter we've seen that and and even people will throw stuff at us once in a while but when you're when you're gonna when you're gonna do it if you're gonna do it to the actual team and tag them <laughs> be, be prepared you better make sure you got your facts right so it's kind of a funny night after the fact with some of the tweets and 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 whatnot was going on but like we said good win by the ducks um, they did make a couple moves uh, in this last week too, Eddie. Uh, we saw Holzer actually went down to San Diego. He went through waivers and passed. Um, we also saw Rasmussen. His contract got terminated. Uh, he ended up going to uh, Europe to play. So he's now gone and off the board. Not not much of a cap gain there anyways, but we had all that, and Peterson's up. Also, Gibson is still listed as a lower body injury day-to-day. So those are kind of the updates on the roster as of now. And obviously, we talked about Kessler and how he's not 100%. And we've kind of talked about that at length. Um, I guess we can kind of talk about some of the, the trades going on now and maybe how this affects what's going to go on and, and get into the fan questions as well because um, people want to know, you know, what are the Ducks going to do? Um, you know, come trade deadline, we, you know, we've had some questions about that. Um, Khalid asks us, you know, what the Ducks win against the Blackhawks and the, or, excuse me, against the um, Vegas Knights and the current winning streak. Uh, you know, is it enough for Murray to make a move? 
And uh, you and I talked about it on the last show. We still are of the opinion that he's going to do something. We don't know how big. Um, I know there's a couple of trades that went down, Eddie, that you kind of want to talk about because they kind of affect the value of some of the defensemen if that's the route the Ducks want to go. Um, but, you know, it's, there's still room to do stuff. I, I think they can still improve a little bit on the defensive side. I mean, right now they're rotating Peterson in and Bjex and Boschman out. I don't know if that's a permanent fix, Eddie. But um, what do you think as far as, you know, with the Ducks getting this winning streak going after Murray's comments? Yeah, I, I don't know so much if, you know, it's I, th- I still kind of believe that Murray's comments were to motivate the team. I don't know if they were 100% truthful in the fact that he wasn't talking to anybody. Because we had heard, I think McGuire had said on like NHL Network or something that Murray was actually the busiest GM, so it's kind of contradicting reports. And and I know the comments in the Athletic are from Murray himself, but I I still kind of believe they were to motivate the team, and, and maybe it's worked. I mean, the Ducks have won three in a row, so I would think the fact that they're sitting in a playoff spot right now, and if they can continue playing well over these next three games leading up to the trade deadline, then I think then you know he kind of has to look towards making a move and and it's interesting i mean we had talked about the fact that after the Dallas game you kind of you kind of can sit back look where you are and decide if you're going to make a trade because the the game against Arizona and Edmonton are, are two days and 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 one day before the trade deadline so it's kind of late to wait till then and wait till the last day and kind of make an assumption of where you're at so i th- i think it will be interesting i i still kind of don't want to make uh, any assumptions before the Dallas game is over, but I, I, you can kind of look at a couple of things that have gone on. Um, I believe it, yeah, Michael Kempney from Chicago was traded for a third round pick to, to Washington. And today, uh, Nick Holden was traded to the Bruins for a third round pick. So it looks like the going rate for a bottom pairing defenseman is about a third round pick, which doesn't bode, bode well for names we've mentioned before. Anybody in the in the top four range, in McDonough or Yamelson or Mike Green or anything of that sort, looks like it's going to take a lot more than uh, than obviously a third round pick. We knew that, but it's going to be around a first round pick at least, plus more, maybe a prospect or, or something around that. And I don't know if the Ducks do that. Um, I didn't think they would do it before. I think with the way the prices are, are kind of going, I definitely don't think they do it now. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see what they do. I, I think they have to add. I know we talked with Hannah on the last show, and she thought they still need that top six, top nine winger. I think with the guys available, that might be the route the Ducks go to at least add something to their lineup. But I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. It's going to be an interesting deadline, that's for sure, because they're, they're in a weird spot right now where they're looking better right now, but they've been inconsistent all season, and, and I think a lot of it goes into how they play against Dallas and, and then even going into against Arizona and Edmonton as well. Yeah, like we said on the last show, they could either add a top six or nine forward or they could add another defensive player. I, I do think... You know, since the last show, uh, Peterson coming up has maybe changed that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Him coming in, he's played three solid games. I mean, he's not playing a ton of minutes. You know, he's averaging about 12 minutes over those three games. But still, he's come in, not made any kind of mistakes that we've seen from uh, BX or Boschman. And obviously, he's a faster skater. Of course, he's a much younger guy. So that's helped out. I don't know if that's a permanent um, solution. But the way the pairings are going, they kind of changed it around a little bit too in these games. And that was another fan question we had from Alex. You know, he asked, you know, what do you think the ideal pairing should be? Um, Manson and Lindholm, have, uh, he said, quote, have been um, stellar together, but do they serve the team better being apart? Um, to me, it's really situational, I think, Eddie. I think it depends on who the Ducks are playing. I mean, if you're, yeah. you're trying to shut down a Connor McDavid, type line you want Manson and Lindholm together if you're playing um you know an Arizona team then yeah you do split them apart and you spread it around um I, I really think it's it's situational based uh, I don't know what do you think as far as the defensive pairings I, I think you need to establish you know your three pairings like the Ducks had been running for the majority of the season it was Manson Lindholm Fowler BX and Montour Boschman and obviously they weren't working out but you want to have that kind of chemistry you want to know who you're playing with every night and I think they got to get that established with the Pedersen call up if he's going to stay up long term or not or if they go out and get a guy and I think that's something we'll kind of have solidified after the trade deadline seeing what they do and if Pedersen ends up remaining up with the Ducks uh, I think that will be interesting but but yeah I, you know always having that Lindholm Manson pairing to fall back on you know late in games we've seen Carlisle do it already where if the Ducks are struggling or needing to hold on to a lead you usually see them get put back together 
But I, I think it's been an interesting experiment having them apart. Um, trying to see if you can get at least two strong pairings. I've liked what I've seen from Fowler and Montour to some extent. They haven't blown everybody out of the water and been great, but they haven't been poor either. So I think giving them a little bit more time together, seeing if they can gel, would be an interesting pairing. Uh, other than the first game, at least in, in shot attempts, uh, Manson and Pedersen haven't been that great, especially the game against Vegas. They, they kind of bled shots in, in the third period, but again, pretty much everybody did in that third period against Vegas. So... I think having them together for a couple more games, seeing if they'll work, is interesting. And then you've got Lindholm paired with either Boschman or BX, and kind of just trying to keep them afloat, because if anybody can keep them afloat, it's going to be Hampus Lindholm. So I think he's been (laughs) pretty good with them. Um, It's hard to judge them, because Lindholm is doing the lion's share of work whenever he's on the ice with one of them. But uh, like uh, like you said, and like Alex was saying, you you always have that option to fall back on with Lindholm and Manson and put them together at different times in the game if you're looking to hold on to a lead or or they're putting some pressure on you. You can throw those two guys out there together, uh, and you know that they're going to play well together. You know, I think uh, your comments really go towards Lindholm. I mean, the ability to take him and and put him with the guys that you have some concerns about, BX or Boschman, and basically just let him do his game. I mean, that's, I think, one of the huge parts of this, and I think that's why uh, they've had to shift sometimes on the defensive pairings but i do agree with you down the stretch they've got to solidify it as best they can whether they're going to roll with manson and lindholm together or apart they've got to kind of figure that out and and go with it towards you know um the rest of the season but say for example they do go separate and they're playing in a game and for some reason the defense is not working out uh you know maybe through two periods then yeah maybe the third period you do put manson and Lindholm back together um you know maybe either to protect a lead or to st- stop the other team from scoring whatever the situation is so if that happens i'm not against carlisle making an in-game change that way but i agree with you they got to try to get some established you know momentum going and um, you know, that kind of goes back to the forward stuff, too, that you talked about. And obviously, Hannah brought up on the last show, you know, what are the Ducks going to try to do on the offensive side? And we had Carlo ask a question, uh, you know, Getzloff, Kessler, the Rico line, you know, if they're all working and, and producing to, uh, together, um, how does Eves fit if he comes back? And also, I guess we can kind of tailor that question to, hey, if the Ducks get another player, how does that work? So yeah. um, I'll go to the first part, the Eves part. Uh, one of my friends, Dwayne, he goes to a lot of the uh, the Ducks practices. He went and you know we posted uh, that video of Eve skating, and it sounds like uh, if there's any chance, he may not come back at all this season. But if there is any chance, Eve's th- there may be a chance, and I just maybe a chance that he comes in the playoffs. And I'm saying that real loosely. Don't take it, you know, take it with a grain of salt because that that's kind of what I've heard actually from Eve's talking to him. Um, and different uh, things, but you can't really count on that. So, you know, if the Ducks get him back in the playoffs and he can fit in this lineup, or if they get another forward in this trade deadline like Hannah was really um, big on, um, how do you think they fit in? And, and I think that's a tough question, Eddie. I mean, the way that these lines have been going, I, I don't really see a, a guy fitting in uh, so much. I mean, you've got that third line really going well. Um, the Kessler line, uh, you know, has been hit and miss. Um, but I, I think it's tough. I, I, I still have the opinion to go get a defensive player. I think it's going to be hard if they get a forward, unless they trade a forward out, um, like Richie, which we'll talk about too. We've got some fan questions on that, but I, I don't really see someone coming back to fit. I mean, it's, it's going to be tough. I mean, if Eves is able to come back, that'd be great. You know, this, if that's even possible, but, um, I think it's tough. Yeah. I I mean, starting with the Eves, I think, the logical place to plug him back in if he came back at all would be with Ryan Getzlaf. Uh, and then you kind of have to decide who moves off that line because I think you know they've been very good together since being put together over the last few games. And, and Perry's kind of looked a lot better playing with those two guys. You know He had that, that goal against Minnesota on the power play as well. Um, I, I just think... It's tough. I, I think obviously, you know, with the way Getzlaff and Eves play together, you would have to plug him in there and then maybe move Perry yeah. down to, you know, I don't want to say the fourth line, but you'd, right. have to, you'd have to do some serious line shuffling if you're going to do that. And, and that kind of throws a wrench in things because, like you said, how the fourth or the third line is playing. 
Uh, the second line with Kessler hasn't been that great, so maybe you can change some things up there. Who knows? But it would definitely take some line shuffling, and then that kind of goes into if the Ducks do acquire a winger, whether it be Grabner, or Vanek, or, or whoever it is, uh, it'd be interesting to see where they get put in. I, I had mentioned this before. I think I think I mentioned it on last show with Hannah how Grabner would maybe be the spark the Ducks needed to get Kessler and, and Silverberg going and maybe replace Cogliano on that line, and then you could either move Richie down to the fourth line and plug Cogliano with uh, Henrique and Kasher, or you could move Cogliano down to the fourth line or something like that, and maybe plugging a guy in on that second line trying to get things going, that could be interesting. And and maybe the same kind of goes for Vanek. You plug him on the left wing on that second line and, and see how things go. But it's a tough fit right now because of how well some of these lines are playing. And really the only struggling line is the fourth line, but they barely play anything. And then Kessler's line, and, and I just, I find it hard for Carlisle to, to really split them up. Even though they, they might, you know, they might warrant being split up right now. I just feel like that's the line for him is the most difficult to split up because, you know, I think they, they all feel that eventually they're going to get things going. And a lot of it has to be due to Kessler's injury. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, if you bring in somebody, some forward, no matter what they do, some kind of shuffle has to happen if mm-hmm. another forward comes in. Something has to give. Like you said, either um, if it's if it's Eves coming back in the playoffs, if it's if it's someone at the trade deadline, you you put them with Getzloff, you're going to have to move one of them. Um, do you break up the Kessler line, which has, has been doing decently on defense, not so much on offense? Um, there's, I mean, it, it's kind of a trickle down as soon as you get that player, which I think this is what Murray's got to be looking at too, because if he's not going for a def- defensive player and he's going for an offensive, um, you know, forward, then those are some things to factor into it. Another way to kind of deal with the situation you and I talked about on the show last week with Hannah is about moving out Richie and Travis asks us, you know, would you trade him for a rental? Uh, try it, ride it out. Uh, you know, and I think, there's kind of a mixed thought here. Um, the way that that third line has been going, uh, you have to kind of like what you're seeing. Obviously, he he wins the game in the shootout against Minnesota. He's starting to score some more goals in regulation. Um, there's some interesting stats too, Eddie, that you had brought up before the show, and I know you wanted to bring these up because I um, it even surprised me a little bit. But if you look at the five on five play of Richie over you know X amount of games, he's actually been doing pretty decent. So I mean. I wouldn't mind if they if they did try to trade him and get another forward, but honestly, I I rather them keep him right now and try and get a defensive player because based upon these stats that you're going to talk about right now, um, it it really makes a good argument for keeping him. Yeah, I think we've kind of seen his play improve over the last few games, but a lot of the criticism has come over his last twenty games and. And honestly, you know, I I didn't even know this uh, that he was doing this well or doing well at all five on five and. I think a little bit of credit to to our buddy Patrick who brought this up to me, but you know he, he is sitting second uh, five on five in total points over the last twenty games for the Ducks with ten points. He's tied with Ricard Raquel, who obviously has more points if you include power play and, and whatnot. But that's very interesting, and and again a lot of it comes down to the fact he's playing with Henrik and Kasha because if you look at over the last twenty games, Kasha sits first for the Ducks with thirteen five on five points. Amazingly. All of them are primary points. He has seven goals and six primary assists. He's been the Ducks' best player over the last 20 games. And then Raquel sits in with four goals and six assists for 10 points. And then Richie has two goals and eight assists in 10 points over that period. And I don't know if a lot of people noticed that. I definitely didn't notice that. And, and I guess, you know, a lot of it has to do with the fact of six of those 10 points are, are secondary assists. So a lot of that could be the fact that he's riding a shotgun with Henrik and Cash, and they're all playing well. But you know, you got to give credit where credit's due. He still has ten points, and, and I think things are starting to trend upwards for him. And and maybe he's starting to finally get things going this season, playing with some consistent line mates. And this line's been good. I I don't think you trade him, and and I wasn't really a fan of trading him anyway. You know, we had mentioned before. I think he's still twenty two. I I think the consensus out. He's definitely a bust getting drafted 10th overall with you look at the players that were available. But I think he can still be a contributor on the third line for this team, and he's proven it. Uh, I mean, you know, other than the goal scoring, he's been putting up the points 5-on-5, five five, continue to give him opportunities with this line, and I think he's going to impress going into the to the playoffs. And, and, I mean, other than that, his shooting percentage has been pretty low. He's only shooting about 6%. 
And a lot of that could do with the fact that maybe he's just a little bit unlucky. Maybe he's shooting a lot of his shots from the outside and not getting great shooting opportunities. But we saw on, on the one goal he had this week against Chicago, made a really nice move to the backhand uh, and roofed it upstairs on, on Forsberg. And, and that's something we haven't seen from him in a while. So I think right now with the way they're playing, you kind of have to keep him around unless you can really get that piece that can make the Ducks team a lot better. And like we already said, we mentioned this with Hannah and, and how she doesn't believe the Ducks will go out and get one of those big names either. And we've kind of said we don't think they'll go out and get a Patch Ready or a Hoffman or a Rick Nash or anything. I think that's the only trade you kind of include him in if you're looking to move him at this point. Yeah, I agree with you. And, that, and that's where some people were concerned with Murray's comments in the Athletic article. But you've got to look at the Ducks' um, you know, trade deadline moves. If you look... There's a stat out there. I can't remember exactly where I saw it. But you go back to the 2005-2006 season, the Ducks have actually been uh, one of the most active teams at the trade deadline. It's just the moves aren't those huge blockbuster four, five, six million dollar moves. They're more of these smaller type moves, the, the Patrick Eve type move, you know, different things like that. So I'm with you. I, I think they hang on to Richie uh, unless they try to do something um, – you know, some kind of a combo and some kind of a bigger move, which uh, it could happen, but you know, I, I think it's less than likely that that it will happen come the trade deadline. So, with that said, if the Ducks don't do a whole lot this deadline, say say they really do nothing, say they do like a minor league deal, which we have seen that too. Say you know, if that's the way that they're going to go, we have fan questions, several of them about uh, prospects. And, you know, what are the Ducks, you know, which ones will they bring up? Who's ready? You know, how do they think um, it's going to go? Um, you know, if they stay this way and they got to bring some people up. Um, you know, obviously we see what Troy Terry's doing right now with Team USA. He's been on fire, you know, playing in the uh, Olympics right now. But, uh, you know, some of these players, what what do you think? Um, if the Ducks stand pat, let's just say they don't they do not do jack this this uh trade deadline other than some maybe some minor deals or anything um obviously we've seen peterson is there any other players whether forward or defense you think the ducks bring up and try and try out here in the final months of the season um from san diego i think no um i think you know depending on injury or how players are playing we might see kevin Waugh come up again maybe nick cordillis but i think like i said barring injury i think the lines are kind of set You've got guys swapping in and out here and there. Vermet in and out on the fourth line. Grant in and out of the lineup. JT Brown in and out of the lineup. You've got these spare parts that you can put in on the fourth line or, or if, like, when Castle is out putting Grant on that second line. You know, there, there isn't really a need to bring up any of those guys right now. Um, I think the interesting thing comes on defense because I, I think, you know, they're still testing out Pedersen. His, his minutes have kind of gone down. Over each game, he played about 13 minutes the first game, about 12 the second game. He played about 10 minutes last night against Vegas. So he'll probably get, uh, hopefully get another showing against Dallas, and, and then we'll see from there if he gets sent back down or, or, or not. But yeah, I think the only other call-ups we really see from San Diego are maybe Jacob Magna comes back up, maybe Andy Belinsky comes back up, uh, maybe eventually Jakob Larson gets a chance to come up. But uh, other than that, I don't see too many things going uh, from the goals and coming up to the Ducks. But they have a lot of things going for them prospect-wise. Uh, I mean, some guys lately have been playing well. And these aren't guys who can be called up to the Ducks this season. But you look at uh, one guy, and, and I believe I'd have to check who somebody brought it up. Uh, Jess Bell brought it, brought it up on, on what are our thoughts on, on Maxim Comtois and how he's been playing lately. And, you know, he's been very good. And, and, you know, he was a guy that kind of slipped down in that draft at one point and was projected to go into the first round just because of his versatility and, and how he can play all over the lineup. And he's really turned things on lately with uh, Victoriaville and the QMJHL. He's been unstoppable. He's, this has 61 points in 45 games. Uh, he was a CHL player of the week last week. He's just been on a tear. He had four points the other night against Drummondville, who are a very good team in the, in the QMJHL as well. He's he's just kind of been doing everything for them, and, and it's really good science to see a guy picked in the second round excelling. And, and you know, he had a, a season where he kind of struggled with his goal scoring, and they're looking for things to turn up. And you know, he had 22 goals in 64 games last year, and through 45 games this year, he has 33 goals. So he's really he's really turned it on, and and he's really looking like the player that everybody thought he'd be when he was projected to go into the first round. So I think things are starting to turn around for him. 
Uh, Sam Steele has, has been playing really well with Regina as of lately, and so has Josh Mahura, who is his teammate as well. So those guys have been turning things on late going in, into the, the ending part of the, their seasons. Unfortunately, Max Jones is still injured, so we haven't really seen what he can do with his new team in Kingston. And then, like you had brought up, Troy Terry, three assists last night for the U.S. Uh, in the Olympics. So things are looking pretty bright right now for the Ducks prospects. Whether these guys come up and play next year, I don't really see it. Maxim Comtois has another year where he can play in junior. I would assume he probably does that and plays junior again next year. Uh, Max Jones and Sam Steele are, will be eligible to play with the goals next year. And with the way the Ducks forwards are are lined up, we'll see pretty much all these guys back next year. Uh, maybe other than J- Vermad or JT Brown. And I really don't think playing Max Jones or Sam Steele on the fourth line really benefits their development. So I think realistically, unless they wow anybody out of training camp, I see them probably starting the season next year with the goals. Yeah, I think that's where the rub is, Eddie, is I think uh, as far as Steele and Jones are concerned, like you said, they, they most likely play with the goals next season. But with the way that the Ducks lineup is, I mean, do you want to bring up some of these guys that, you know, as you've talked about, have been doing extremely well, um, you know, whether they're playing in the Olympics or they're playing, you know, for their home team uh, or in college or AHL, wherever it is that they're playing right now. A lot of, a lot of you know, good forward prospects in the system for the Ducks. I mean, you, you know, the future is definitely bright. But I think that's the tough part is would you bring up, you know, a Jones or a Steele just to play on the fourth line? And I have to agree with you. I, I don't like that. I, I wouldn't want to do that. I'd want to see them, mm-hmm. you know, they're not going to be on the first line, but you'd like to see them at least on the third line. And I think with the way that the Ducks lineup is now, I mean, the top nine is, is a pretty crowded field right now. We talk about the fourth line and, you know, Wagner's been on there. Vermette's been on there now. Um, sometimes Grant's on there. I mean, he's filled in for Kessler on the second line. But, you know, you've seen this rotation of players on that fourth line. Um, I, I rather than get more development you know, especially if they're going to start um, joining the goals, especially in Steele and Jones's case, and then go from there. But uh, I think a lot of them are getting close to the next level for the NHL, and I think some of them could be, you know, uh, closer than others. But like you said, the way that the lineup is situated, um, you know, you rather have them playing solid minutes with the goals than you know coming in and only being able to play you know five to ten minutes with the Ducks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I think, you know, realistically what we see specifically from Max Jones and Sam Steele because they will be with the goals next season is they kind of come and get their chances based on their play with the goals and and kind of replacing guys who who are who would be injured next year if if that ever occurs. Because like you said, you look at the top 9 right now, all of the guys currently in the Ducks top 9 will be there again next year and that's assuming Richie and Cash would get re-signed which I think we all believe they will they're only RFAs they're not going to get too much of a raise so I think they'll be back next season and and the lineups could essentially be the same we'll probably see Kessler Cogdano Silverberg together Getzlaff Perry Raquel could be together as well and if Henry Kasha and Richie continues to work out they could be a line that could start the, the season together again next year so what's the point of playing Max Jones and Sam Steele for eight minutes a night when they could be playing, you know, 16, 17, 18 minutes a night down with San Diego and getting more development. So I I think you're right in that aspect. I think it's better for them to get their time with the goals and then make, you know, make the most of it when they do get called up uh, to play with the Ducks. Yeah, I, I think that's the smart thing to do. You you want these guys to get as much experience as they can, so then th- then you can plug them into the lineup and make a smoother transition. I, I just think that's the way that that it should go. Unless, of course, situations come up. Obviously, like this one with Peterson, they've kind of had to throw him up in there now because you know Boschman and Bjexson weren't doing as well. The Ducks were kind of losing some games, things like that. I mean, obviously, injuries and the way the team's playing may change or dictate that. But just going up upon principle, I think that's the way you go. And, uh, you know, with that, the Ducks, they've got three more games coming up here, Eddie, before the trade deadline and all these decisions get made about, you know, whether they're bringing up players or moving players or keeping players or whatever they're going to do. What do you uh, anticipate uh, as the Ducks? They're going to play Dallas, another big game, of course. Dallas has been fighting it out. And then uh, they've got Arizona and Edmonton, obviously two teams that are not doing as well. But, of course, they they still 
uh, you know, are tough opponents. So um, I'm hoping the Ducks get six points. I'm actually going big this week, Eddie. Last week <laughs> I was a little bit, I was a little bit apprehensive. I was, I was praying for four points because I, I wasn't sure how it was going to go with Minnesota and Vegas, and the Ducks pull out six. So, so what do you think this week? Uh, you think the Ducks can pull out six points, or you, you think that the, they may drop one of these games, or what? Yeah, I think the toughest one is obviously going to be against Dallas. They've kind of climbed up the standings. They're actually sitting fourth in the Western Conference now with 72 points. But uh, ironically enough, they're third in the Central because of how good Nashville and Winnipeg are. But this is going to be a tough team. And I think it'll be interesting to see which goaltender we face. And a lot of that kind of depends on if the Ducks are going to win this game or not. Because the... Dallas plays Anaheim on Wednesday, and they play L.A. on Thursday. So we could see Ben Bishop, or we could see Kari Lettinen, and I think we would all rather see Kari Lettinen, not that he's a <laughs> yes. bad goaltender. He still <laughs> can be play like a starter at times, but Ben Bishop has been their, their best goaltender this season. Um, I don't know. I, I think they probably play Bishop against us just because of how the Ducks have been playing lately, mm-hmm. but you never know. I mean, either of them, are, it's going to be a difficult opponent, and, and Dallas has finally, finally remedied their defense. I mean, they're sitting fifth in goals against average, which we normally see them sitting near the bottom over the last few seasons, and they're still sitting top 15 in goals per game, and they're sitting 13th overall, and that's, again, attributed probably to the fact that Tyler Sagan, Jamie Benn, and, and Radulov are one of the best lines in the NHL. So it's going to be a tough game. Uh, luckily, it's at Honda Center, so that's going to be a big plus for the Ducks. Uh, but that's that's the tester this week. Going out and, and beating Dallas at home is going to be important. And, and again, you know the Ducks are still in a battle with Dallas, possibly for a wild card spot. So this is a big game to consider. Um, and then you've got Arizona, which should be an easy win. Uh, but then you've got the Oilers at home right after on a back to back. And and again, the Oilers are struggling this season, but back to backs are always tough. And it'll be interesting to see if Gibson gets uh, in any of these games. We don't know the extent of his injury. Hopefully he can play tomorrow in Dallas. But we'll have to see. I think if he's not ready to go, we'd, probably the next time we see him is against Edmonton. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, and I'll be at the uh, the game against Dallas and the game against Edmonton. And then, of course, you know after the Edmonton game is the trade deadline, which we will have a live show, um, either on Facebook or Google. So we'll, we'll kind of of update you throughout the week and and, and we'll do a, uh, a live show that day and then we'll probably have a podcast either later that night or sometime that week we'll have another show but one last thing that i wanted to end the show on eddie something that happened in the league um not to be a downer but kind of more on a serious note just something i think we should mention is the incident involving former ducks player dsp um as all of you know when Washington played Chicago, he went to the penalty box. And some of the Chicago fans, and again, it's not all of the fans, let's be fair here, but some of the fans there decided to tell him basically to go play basketball. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know if they were drunk. You could see that they were holding beers and whatnot, but they were, were saying that word a couple times over and over to him. And, you know, the, I, I don't want to make this a big political debate, a racial debate, or anything like that, but. You know, hockey is for everybody. And since we've started this show a long time ago, we've made friends all over the world, um, surprisingly. And not saying that because we're so, it's just because that sport goes around and reaches so many people that we've been in. You know, even Eddie and I, uh, some people don't even realize this, we've never even met. <laughs> you know, Eddie's in Canada and I'm over here in SoCal. So, you know, the fact that we're doing the show has been uh, great for, what, four or five seasons now. So I just. I, I really strongly encourage um, you know those conversations and things that are going on. Especially, there's other things going on in the world that we don't even need to go about. But you know about all the stuff that's been going on at schools and things like that around the U.S. and other countries. And I just think it's unfortunate, Eddie, to see this happen. I, I really thought that we could get a little bit further ahead of this, and uh, it's just unfortunate. But I, I am happy that the Chicago organization did ban those fans. Yeah. I don't know if they were season ticket holders or what they were, but I, I think. That's the one good thing that kind of came out of this is obviously those discussions came up. We saw um, JT Brown uh, talk about it a little bit too to Eric Stevens. So there's that conversation going on. He also tweeted out some stuff, which we retweeted as well. Um, Well said um, what he said in his tweet uh, about what's going on in sports in the world. But uh, it's unfortunate. I'm just glad to see the uh, Blackhawk organization take the the right path here. And, um, you know, just shame on those fans. It's just unfortunate that it had to happen. 
Yeah, and like you said, we don't want to spend too much time to to, to really spark any political debate, but it, it's worth noting how it's it's just you know it's just disappointing that this still happens. And it, it like you said, hockey's for everyone. We shouldn't have this happening. Fans shouldn't be doing this at games. It's just it's just ridiculous. It's immature. It, it's blatant racism. Like really, I, I mean, Devontae Smith's Pelly is in the box. You don't have to go out to the box and and chant basketball at him. Like that's just childish. I, I don't know why Stupid. they did it. It's it's ridiculous. But you know, like you said, I mean, good on the Blackhawks organization by banning these people from future games. It it's you know, it's really all they can do. It's the extent of, of their power is banning these guys from coming back to games and that I mean, good on them for doing that. And, you know, there's not really much else they can do, um, the NHL or the Blackhawks other than ban them from games. So I, I think they did what they could do and, and hopefully you know, it, it doesn't really curb any of this from happening again, but at least they're cracking down on it and showing that it isn't acceptable. Yeah, and, and it kind of goes for sports in general. You know, there I know that there's some of you that listen to Eddie and I, um, and you don't always agree with what we talk about. And I know that there's times that we tweet out stuff, and we see some of you tweet stuff back, and you, and you don't agree with exactly what we say. And that's totally fine. That's what our society is about, freedom of speech, having different opinions, and debating things. But... You know, there's certain lines that don't need to be crossed, and this it was crossed in this one. I, it's unacceptable. And same thing too, if if you're debating um, sports with us or other people, you know, just at least be mature about it. You know, we can disagree. You you may think that Eddie's opinion on something's off, or you may think mine's a crazy idea. And I, I totally get it. There's there's fans I talk to, and we don't always agree a hundred percent. And it goes with, I mean, every topic in the world, of course. But you know, we stick to the arena of sports pretty much on our social media we don't go outside that realm so you know for us we welcome conversations we welcome different opinions but we don't welcome immaturity and, and unprofessionalism so that's the big key i think the big lesson out of this and mm-hmm. and hopefully that fans that you know whether you're going to another game and you're a duck fan and, and you're going to chicago and you're, you're going against them or you know la which is a, sometimes a tough place because it's a rivalry you know just just try to, you know, if you're going to go with a different opinion, at least just be an adult about it. That, I guess that's really the only thing I can say, Eddie, because otherwise you're going to end up like these fans. And the teams aren't going to tolerate this. And you're going to get banned, and, and now you're you're screwed from seeing your team play probably forever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, we've seen this. The sad thing is we've seen this happen more, more often than not. I mean, it's not the first time this has happened. It's probably not going to be the last time, which is unfortunate. And, and like we had mentioned, I mean – it's it's good that they're they're saying this isn't acceptable, and you know we had talked about the hockey hockey's for everything or for everyone thing, but yeah, I, I mean there's not much more I can say. It's just disappointing and it's sad to see that this still happens. I I mean I don't understand how fans can go into a game and think it's acceptable to do something like that. Uh, you know, criticizing a player whether whether it's like whether it's criticizing a player or being race blatantly racist like they were being. I, I mean, I remember back um, I had gone to a game. It was I think it was a flyer. Yes, it was because it was Wayne Simmons. It was a Flyers preseason game in London, where I'm from, and somebody had thrown a banana on the ice when Wayne Simmons ridiculous uh, was taking a penalty shot or a shootout goal, and that was uh, that was a huge topic at the time. And it's just ridiculous that things like this continue yeah. to happen. It, it's just so unfortunate. Yeah. And even if you're not in person, you know, when you're on social media and stuff, you know, be be aware of what you post because, I mean, sometimes we post stuff that we don't, it's pretty neutral base, but sometimes it, it flares up stuff. So just got to be careful what you're doing out there. So, um, but like we said, they did the right thing. So with that, we have a big week coming up. The Ducks have another three big games before the trade deadline. We're going to have a live show. We're going to have another podcast. We're going to cover all that stuff. Um, We'll definitely have some more watch parties before the season ends. I'm not sure of the dates yet. Thank you to everybody that came to the last one. Some of you that came early, you guys are awesome. And thank all of you for listening. Um, Like we said, I know you guys don't necessarily agree with everything we have to say, but I appreciate that you guys listen. We take in your fan questions. We give you our opinions and our analysis of what we think we're seeing out there. And um, so far, it's been you know a good ride for the last several years. We're going to keep on doing it, and we'll see you next week uh, during the trade deadline. Let's go, Ducks.